Hello, I'm Summer Helm, Project Coordinator with U.S. Engineering Innovations Team. I'm also part of the Wellness Committee, and with Suicide Prevention Month and Awareness Upon Us, we've decided to conduct this video. Joining me today to answer some questions is Rafi Billick, a licensed therapist and owner of Baltimore Therapy Center. Thanks for joining us, Rafi. You're welcome. Happy to be here. The first question that we have is, why do people commit or want to commit suicide? Uh, so obviously, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, certainly, a lot of people who commit suicide have a mental illness um, that's driving it, but not everybody. Uh, and according to some people, uh, not most people. Um, I think that a major driver is this feeling of, of burdensomeness. That's kind of what the research is showing, that people feel like they're a burden, um, that they are, people are better off without them, that it's too much trouble, that they have their own burdens. And so it's um, to, to relieve themselves and other people, they come to believe the best thing would be if they weren't there. Um, also, you know, if the pain is just, the emotional pain they're in is just too much to handle, it's easier, it's less painful not to be there. Um, you know, shame is involved as well. People with a mental illness or oh, some, you know, massive thing happens, somebody was caught for a crime or something, often trying to get out of having to face that uh, or just can't, can't bear the thought of it and so decide to take their life instead of having to deal with that. Thank you. And the next question, is suicide really as big of a deal or concern as we're led to believe through social media and the news? I mean, you know, I, I have the same research everybody else does. It's, um, it's out there. It's a big thing. I recently saw that it's actually the second leading cause of death globally. Um, I don't know how they come to those statistics. It's obviously, it's a big issue. It's a big issue, and um, having better mental health care out there, better access to resources uh, would be great. You know, more awareness, I think, is important. Um, and there really are a lot of little ways that um, that the world can improve on this. You know, it's funny, little things like having a net by the bridge, which a lot of people think like, okay, well, what does that do? The truth is, when people are prevented from committing suicide, it happens less. So it, it is a thing out there, and there's lots of ways that it can be addressed. And has COVID impacted this issue? And if so, how much? Oh, certainly, yeah. You know, lots of different estimates out there, but everyone is agreeing that it's gone up a lot in recent times and for obvious reasons. I mean, mental illness has spiked um, due to the pressures of COVID. Uh, the isolation that it caused caused a lot of trouble. And, you know, isolation is one of the prime drivers of mental illness, suicide, when you can't connect with people who are meaningful in your life. Uh, and then people who are having physical symptoms, uh, you know, people lost loved ones, people who are being long term affected by COVID. So it's definitely, uh, we've definitely seen an increase in the past two years almost now. Wow. And do people attempt suicide to get attention or sympathy? You know, um, I think that is a common uh, perspective out there. It's not as much that. There certainly are people who are using it as a cry for help. Um, it's more often than not, it's a very serious cry for help. It's not someone who's just trying to get paid attention to which they need some, some real help and they don't have a, a mechanism for asking for that or seeking that beyond the extreme. Uh, but for most people, it's not really that. Like we discussed earlier, it's people really trying to get out of what they find to be an intolerable situation, whether their circumstances or their emotional reality and just really trying hard to get away from that. And what's the importance, if any, that our workplace um, take mental health seriously and what can they do to help? So, yeah, right. The workplace is definitely somewhere where changes can be made and attention can be paid in ways that will help. Um, having mental health services, I think you had mentioned to me earlier that uh, USC has some mental health services available. That's really important um, where people can go when something is going wrong, that they have a judgment free place to go. Uh, you know, somewhere that doesn't cost a lot. Um, I think you guys have some free services for, for six months or something like that. Do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so U.S. Engineering has um, a service that they've partnered with um, EAP with New Directions. It can be found on the NES, and what they do is they offer six months free therapy for those that are employees and extended family, immediate family, excuse me, of um, the U.S. Engineering employee. Um, it's very, very easy to use. You just can go to their website and you fill out some information of what you need, what you're looking for, as well as putting in a code that U.S. Engineering provides. 
and then they'll just send you a list of uh, licensed therapists that are approved in your area and you can choose like look into them and choose which ones you want to contact for consultation or um, just an appointment um, in general. Right, yeah, so that's a super helpful thing that workplaces do. And obviously things like this where we get the awareness out and let people know that it's available is really important in helping people access resources when things get tough. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why do people commit or attempt to commit suicide if they don't seem like they're sad? Right, that's another great question that a lot of people have. They don't really understand that. So first of all, um, being depressed does not necessarily mean walking around crying all the time. Um, there's different ways it can manifest, and for people who are really suffering inside, a lot of them feel that they have to put on a good face, and they have to uh, make it look okay, and that's part of the, the distress that they're in, is that they're ashamed to have the problem they have, or they believe that they, they have to, you know, there's an obligation, they, they, they can't show their weakness or whatever it is, and so they put on this great face, but, you know, the more you do that, the more that the distress increases. And so certainly, you know, there, there's a surprise for a lot of people when that kind of thing happens. Like, you know, a few years ago when Robin Williams killed himself, that was a big shock to a lot of people. He was, he was like this funny, happy guy. You never really know what's inside. Okay, thank you. And what should parents do if their child is having suicidal thoughts? Also, what if that parent just thinks that their child is being dramatic? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a pretty scary thing to hear your your child say. Um, it's really important to get them connected to services and to get help. Um, yes, it's possible they're being dramatic. I mean, teenagers have a reputation for saying and doing pretty crazy things. Um, but it's worth checking out. You know, if you have a good relationship with your child and, and can talk it out and have an open conversation, so great. Um, a lot of people don't have that kind of close relationship where their kid is willing to share these really difficult things with them. And so, you know, making sure that they have the resources also for them, whether it's talking to the guidance counselor at school or getting, getting them an appointment with a therapist, it's not something to ignore. I would not say, well, it's just dramatic, let's just ignore it. I mean, maybe teenagers have a lot of drama. It's not worth the risk. I would say, you know, get it checked out, get them talking to somebody, talk to them yourself, make sure that you're on top of it. And can risk of suicide tendencies be inherited from the, from the parent? You know, it's not exactly clear what the heritability is, but it, it does run in families. And it is absolutely a known risk factor. If there has been suicide in the family elsewhere, there is a higher risk for someone committing suicide. Um, so, yeah, it, it does run in families. It's, you know, there, there seems to be some genetic component, although obviously genetics is pretty complicated. It's not a direct relation. But, uh, yeah, that's something to be aware of. And what are the warning signs someone may be contemplating this and what's the right way to ask them if they are? Right, so uh, the warning signs aren't, aren't necessarily so subtle. People will talk about committing suicide, they'll talk about not wanting to be here or you know, people would be better off without them. Um, sometimes you know, major changes in eating or sleeping uh, or uh, you know, writing a suicide note um, or giving away all their stuff. Or not appearing to care anymore about anything. You know, um, certainly there are more subtle signs, you know, depression, anxiety, mental illness of, of any kind, um, you know, big changes in their lives. Um, those are things that are harder to spot in somebody, but often it's, uh, there are, you know, signs that can be uh, caught on to, and often not. You know, it's not like we need to be blaming ourselves for other people's actions. Um, it, it's important that if you see something that does worry you, to, to ask people. Um, it may not be like, you know, an on the on the street kind of thing like, hey, Bob, how's it going? Ever thought of killing yourself? It's more like if you're having a conversation with someone you're close to, you say, hey, like, I noticed that you, things have been tough for you recently. What's going on? You seem down, et cetera. And at some point, just to ask the question, like, hey, have you been thinking of harming yourself? Have you been thinking of killing yourself? Um, there's this myth out there that if you open the topic, someone's going to be like, huh, you know, that's actually a good idea. But that's that's not what the research shows. Talking about it tends to help. Um, it, it, they've been thinking about it anyways. You're not going to plant ideas in their mind. And it's really important in terms of helping people to just be open about that conversation. Okay, thank you. And what should we do if someone tells us that they are thinking about it? Like what steps do we need to take? Um, you know, so if someone is distantly thinking about it, that's not necessarily an, uh, a critical emergency. If someone is saying, Hey, I'm about to jump off a bridge or something. That's that's an emergency. That's a 911 call. 
Um, and in fact, uh, the, the usual question that people are trained to ask when dealing with this, if someone says, I'm thinking about it, the next question is, do you have a plan? Um, you know, the more somebody has planned, the more detailed they are with their plan, the more likely it is to happen. Um, but, you know, you're, you as the average layperson do not need to be triaging for suicide risk or, or assessing that. If someone is in need, you say, hey, you know, can we talk about it? Can I help you? Can, can I help you connect you to somebody uh, who can help? You know, certainly if they have this EAP thing or, or if they don't, you, you call a therapist, you call a suicide hotline, whatever else it is. Um, it's not something to be ignored. If someone says they're thinking about it, you know, like work with them and see where you can connect them. You don't have to be the person to solve the problem, but maybe you can make the connection. Okay. And what can we do or say if there's someone we know who's lost a loved one to suicide or a friend? It's, it's a really tough situation. It's really hard. Um, look, it's the same thing when anybody faces a tragedy. There's nothing you can say that's going to make it better. Uh, and there's no there's no words that make it go away. It's a question of just being there for somebody. Like, hey, you know, this is really tough. I'm sorry this, ha this has happened to you. I'm here to talk about it if you want. And you let them guide the conversation. If they want to talk about the person, great. If they don't, don't. Um, you know, you don't need to say things like, oh, it's not so bad. Oh, they're in a better place. All the kind of comforting, reassuring things that we tend to say to, to make ourselves feel better don't often help. Or I know how you feel, same thing happened to me. Even if the same thing happened to you, you, you probably don't know exactly how they feel. Although if you've had that in, in your life as well, you can you can certainly say, hey, um, you know, the same thing happened to me, would you like to talk about it? And just, you know, share a little bit if they want. Um, but mostly just being there for them and saying, hey, you know, you're not alone. Being connected to somebody is the most important thing. And why is talking about suicide or mental illness such a taboo for so many people? You know, there, there's still a sense of shame around mental illness, as if uh, the person has done something wrong. Um, you know, in, in many cultures, it's kind of hidden and, and brushed away because there's some kind of like sinfulness around it. Certainly, suicide has a history of um, connection with sin. You know, committing suicide is the same kind of term as committing a crime. And, and nowadays, people in the field try to steer away from that language because it, it implies that there's some kind of crime committed there. It is illegal in some places, but you know the the point is that people we come from this place where like it's it, it's bad, it's bad, it's a sin, or you're wrong, uh, or you're weak, um, and so there's all this shame surrounding it, uh, and people aren't so good about talking about shame. Um, you know, the family might feel like they didn't do enough, they could have done more, they're embarrassed, and so there's there is a big taboo around talking about it, uh, which is unfortunate because really talking about it is really what helps us most get out of these difficult situations. Is there a verbiage that you can use that's different to open up the conversation instead of using words like commit that would um, show like like committed a crime and stuff like that? Is there a different verbiage that we should be using or could use to open up the conversation? So I know that um, sort of there's been evolving language around this. So I'm not up on what the latest kind is, um, you know, taking your own life. Uh, you know, are you, are you thinking of taking on your life? Are you thinking of harming yourself? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Uh, someone who killed them, someone who, who died by suicide or someone who suicided. These are all sort of much more neutral ways of, uh, of dealing with it as opposed to, um, I don't know that people are so sensitive that they notice that commit sort of implies a crime, but, you know, just trying to develop a language in a way that is clear that there's no blame on somebody who um, had a struggle and um, was overwhelmed. And I know a lot of people think things like, oh, I wish I was dead, or I wish I was just like, I wasn't here just because things in their life went poorly or they got embarrassed. At what point should we actually take stock and be concerned within our own thoughts to seek help? Um, if you're feeling down, seeking help is a good thing. Uh, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to a therapist and saying, hey, I'm feeling a little down. Can we work through it? Uh, or connecting with some friends. You know, isolation is definitely the worst thing for uh, depression, which is ironic because that's what that's what you want to do when you're depressed is just sit in your bed and be isolated. Um, you know, it, if you are feeling an urge to actually do something and you are planning details, that is more concerning. And that I would definitely say, like, hey, go talk to somebody now. Um, you know, call call uh, a suicide hotline or a general mental health hotline and talk it out, find a therapist. 
Um, you know, I think it's true that a lot of people do on bad days wish like it was all done and they didn't have to deal with this. Um, you know, people have to check in with themselves. If, if they feel there's a risk that something will actually happen, um, they should definitely talk to somebody. And even before, if there's no harm in calling and reaching out and getting some help. Um, so one question that I was really interested in knowing is when I was growing up, it was very, very big that if within my family, that if you saw anybody about your mental health, like, um, that you would be crazy. Like everybody would know about it. Like you would be like shunned. So is that true? If I seek a therapist or help, is it going to be on some record that the world can see? Um, it, it might be true in your family that you'll be shunned. I can't talk about your family, but um, the, you know, as far as the records are, um, it's totally confidential. There's all kinds of rules uh, that we have to deal with that strongly protect confidentiality. Nobody's allowed to find out that you saw a mental health therapist uh, unless you're in danger. You know, if uh, if you tell a therapist you're about to jump off a bridge, so the therapist will call 911. Hopefully, um, your family members are not, are not allowed to find out unless you tell them. Um, they can't call the therapist. It can't, you know. It, it does go on a medical record um, if you see a therapist. That's true, just like any medical procedure. Um, and and in, in theory, that could that could be discovered if you committed some major crime. They could subpoena your records. Um, but we're talking about extreme circumstances here. Generally speaking, it's extremely confidential. Uh, and now, especially with everything on Zoom, you know, you, you find someone online, you connect on your computer in your house, and you know, nobody knows. Um, Again, not that it's a shameful thing. Everybody should be seeking help. It's great to have a therapist, um, but certainly people who want to keep it private, it, it is absolutely a private thing. Okay, and if someone um, wants to find a, a therapist, what should they be looking for? I know that we mentioned um, earlier U.S. Engineering offers help in this area, but if they if somebody wanted to go outside of the, the company and what we offer, how would they find a, a therapist and what should they be looking for? Um, so finding a therapist is, is super easy these days. You go on Google, you type therapist near me or whatever it is, or for whatever issue you have, and you'll have like 100,000 people come up. Um, if you have insurance that you want to go through, so you can call up the number on the back of your insurance card and say, hey, I need a therapist who's in my area. They'll find you somebody. Um, and in terms of what to look for, you know, you, you want somebody probably who has some experience and expertise in your particular issue that you're going, you know, you don't want to see like an eating disorder specialist if you're having anxiety attacks, whatever it is. Um, but it's really important to talk to somebody, meet somebody. It's really a personal connection. You have to see the person, like the person, know the person. Um, a lot of therapists will offer free consultations so you can chat with them and see how you feel. And it's really about just, you know, how you feel the, the fit is. And what if, an individual doesn't really feel connection with the therapist that they went to go see. Do they have to just stick with that therapist? Yes. For the rest of their lives, they must only see that therapist who's a terrible therapist. They don't like them. But what can you do? It was the first person you saw. There's no choice. Um, you know, you, you have to like the person. There's nothing wrong with shopping around and trying to get the right person. Try two or three or four different folks. What you don't want to do is every two, three weeks switch to a different person uh, or when you hear something you don't like, like, okay, I'm done, I'm going to someone new. You want to find someone you like and feel comfortable with and stick with them. And if it takes a couple of uh, tries, that's fine. Okay. And our last question, is therapy, like, is the session like it is in the movies? Am I going to be laying on a couch with someone asking me, how do you feel about that? Or am I going to get choked out like Goodwill Hunting? Like, what's the vibe? Um, yeah, just like everything else in life, Hollywood has depicted it extremely accurately, right? Um, yeah, I mean, Hollywood has a fantasy version of it for its own purposes, whether it's comedic or dramatic or whatever it is. Um, and the truth is, it's uh, there are different kinds of therapy that do different kinds of things. There are people who will lie you down on a couch and ask you about your mother. Uh, and then there's people who will, you know, do a lot more physiological, you know, yoga, stretching type of therapies that are emotional therapies and there's like everything in between there's cognitive behavioral therapy and couples counseling all kinds of different things um so really that's a great question to ask the therapist like hey what's therapy like with you what do we talk about what do we do are we focusing on my body are we focusing on my thoughts are we focusing on my relationships uh what kind of issues are we going to deal with what kind of questions will you ask and you know get to know and, and see um it, it's definitely not uh, very hollywood um but it's very helpful and worth a shot 
Well, I really appreciate you joining us, Rafi, and answering our questions. Super. It's been a good time. Um, I hope that the help gets out to whoever needs it. And uh, certainly, you know, you guys have resources to help those in need. So I hope people will seek it when needed. Thank you. Thank you.